Hello and welcome. I'm Liz Booker, and I'm thrilled to host the co-authors of an exciting new book, American Wings, Chicago's Pioneering Black Aviators and the Race for Equality in the Sky. Fewer than 10% of pilots and aircraft mechanics are women. These are their stories of tenacity, adventure, and courage. Stories with the power to inspire, heal, and connect. Welcome to the literary aviatrix community, where we leverage the power of story to build and celebrate our community and inspire the next generation of aviation. Cherie L. Smith, welcome back. Thank you. It's exciting to be here. It is so exciting to have you. And Elizabeth Ween, welcome back. Thank you. Oh you do gosh. the best work. Oh, thank you. <laughs> you you both do the best work, which is something that I've been gushing about all over social media, that you two especially came together to tell this amazing and impressive history that just seems to have been, you know, buried in the crevices up until this book. Um, for those of us, so I had the pleasure, the very distinct honor of of being able to inter interview both of you during my first season. So people can go back to those interviews on the website or on the podcast and um, hear in depth about your other work and your careers and those kinds of things. But just very briefly, we'll start with Cherie. Can you just kind of give us a framework of what brings you uh, to this story? Uh, well, the short answer is Elizabeth Ween brings me <laughs> to this story. Um, that and my, um, I guess, so a couple of my previous books uh, Fly Girl um, is about a light-skinned black girl who passes for white to join the Women's Air Force Service pilots in World War II. And uh, at the beginning of that book, her dream is to get her pilot's license from a school in Chicago that is known to be run by and um, willing to teach African Americans um, the coffee flying school. And um, that was based, in fact, on a guy named Cornelius Coffey. Um, so I had written about that. And then when I wrote a nonfiction book called Who Were the Tuskegee Airmen, um, I included a sidebar about Coffey because he um, was instrumental in training a lot of people who went on to be instructors for the Tuskegee Airmen. And then um, I wrote another World War II aviation book. It's a it's a it's a bug of mine um, called The Blossom and the Firefly, and it's uh, World War II Japan. But when we were talking about like dream authors to get a jacket blurb from uh, Elizabeth Ween's name came up, and um, we reached out to her. And I'd known I, I'd never met Elizabeth before, but when Fly Girl came out, everybody would say to me, oh, have you read Codename Verity by Elizabeth Wayne? It's amazing, which was cool. But she was sort of like the Ferris Bueller and I was the sister. I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Everybody loves Ferris. What about, you know, what about my book? What about me? And so um, when we reached out to Elizabeth, I was sort of like, Sheree, get over it. You need Ferris's approval for your book. And uh, and then um, you didn't know you were Ferris Bueller, did you? And then my editor comes back to me and she's like, Elizabeth says she'll give you a blurb, but she wants to talk to you. And mm -hmm. I just, I thought, okay, it's going to be a, a street fight or something. I don't know what's going to happen. And, um, and instead it was, would you be interested in writing this book with me? Oh, Sheree, that's such a great story. Elizabeth, how about you? Tell us about your background and then how you how you decided oh, okay. to pick Sheree. So <laughs> I am, uh, World War II fiction is kind of also my thing. And that is because I got a pilot's license in 2003, which is kind of longer ago than I like to admit, because I'm still very much a, a baby pilot. <laughs> but before that, I wrote... Uh, historical fantasy. And once I started to fly, I just wanted to write about flying. And I was pretty much the only civilian woman on my airfield who was taking flying lessons. Um, I was in my 30s. And I was baffled by the lack of, of other women in um, light aviation, where I was learning to fly here in Scotland, which is where I live. And I became, that's what got me interested in women in aviation. I just, you know, started, started kind of like looking around to see what the history was and, you know, who the firsts were. And it was through that, that I 
started uncovering other as it were minority aviators so you know women were so scarce that they tended to crop up with other people who were who were scarce in early aviation and that's how i discovered cornelius coffee and his crew um and john c robinson who he worked with in the early part of his aviation career was a a very interesting guy who ended up going to ethiopia and flying for haile selassie when the italians were invading ethiopia in 1935 36 and I actually included Johnny Robinson as a fictional character under a different name in my novel, Black Dove, White Raven. And I also in that book gave a nod to the Coffee Flying School, the, the kid who is the, one of the two main characters in that book ends up there at the end of the, at the end of the book. And so I knew about them. I knew about the Tuskegee Airmen because I discovered them when I was writing Codename Verity and I wanted to, to include a black airman in right at the end of that and kind of like a cameo role and discovered that I couldn't use an American because they weren't flying the right kinds of planes and they weren't flying in integrated units. Uh, so I used a Caribbean man. But I knew about these people as well. And I'd read fly girl and i loved fly girl and i have had people say to me oh you wrote Cody Rarity. have you read fly girl <laughs> <laughs> so it does it does cut both ways <laughs> and uh, and when sheree's agent sent me the blossom and the firefly i or was it your editor who said that editor. doesn't matter yeah. your editor sent me the blossom and the firefly and i read it and it was also wonderful and i thought huh, this woman, she's written about the Tuskegee, Tuskegee Aviator. She knows who Cornelius Coffey is. She does fantastic historical research. She writes about World War II and flying. Our, our paths have not really crossed, but they are, you know, paralleling each other. And I had just finished, I had just published a nonfiction book about aviators um, called A Thousand Sisters about the Soviet women who flew combat missions in World War II. And that had been a boatload of hard work. And I th thought, I really want to write about these people in Chicago, but I don't want to do it alone. <laughs> and, and Cherie just seemed like the obvious person to ask. And and having, having her reach out at exactly that moment when I was kicking around looking for a, a new nonfiction topic was, you know, it was serendipitous was that was perfect. the word so i we, was going to use see thank you why we, can we do together. this a lot yes we finish each other's sentences oh, that's, adorable. <laughs> that's adorable oh my gosh i can't wait to hear like i i, I got to, so i had the privilege of seeing you on tour recently um you were doing a pretty hard press at schools in california and i think i got you on the tail end of that the last night that you were there at roman's bookstore in pasadena and i was just sat up right in the front like the fangirl that i am <laughs> and i loved everything that you guys did um in sharing both the history that i i want you to talk about here but also kind of talking about the writing process but so like you've already dropped the names you know um cornelius coffee at least the men's names so far so i'm just gonna stay out of your Way. You guys did such a good job and kind of honed this storytelling so well and, and worked so well off of each other. I'm going to stay out of your way. And if I, if I have a question, I'll jump in. But take it away, ladies. Tell us about this book. Okay, so we mentioned the men's names. We didn't mention the women's names, but obviously they came up at the same time when I was, you know, sort of doing my fooling around looking looking for people and they came up um also because women were so unusual flying uh in the early days i kind of want to say it was more normal for women to fly in the 1930s than it is now mm -hmm. uh, but you had to go back to find them and of course it was extremely unusual for a black woman to be flying and i don't know if we've made it clear but all these aviators that we're talking about are black and Willa Brown, who worked with Coffee at his flying school and pretty much, you know, ran the place um, from an administrative point of view for years and years, she just fascinated me. She she was the first black woman to get uh, federal uh, pilot 
private pilot's license in the USA. She was the first black woman to get a limited commercial license. She was the first black woman to hold an office in the Civil Air Patrol. So she she did all these amazing things. And we hear a lot about Bessie Coleman. Now we hear a lot about Bessie Coleman, who was the first black woman to get a international pilot's license and indeed the first black woman to get a license um, and the trials and tribulations that she had to go through in order to do that. But we kind of don't hear about anybody who came after her and she actually inspired a ton of people so she inspired our aviators um sheree why don't you take it from there yeah. well so you know the story the nonfiction books always have these incredibly long subtitles <laughs> Um, to explain what they are. So our book is American Wings, Chicago's Pioneering Black Aviators in the Race for Equality in the Sky. And so while most of the story is set in Chicago, it is um, it starts um, with our young people who um, we focus on four people. So Cornelius Coffey, John C. Robinson, the incredible Willa Brown, and another um, woman named Janet Harmon Waterford uh, later. Janet Harmon Bragg um, when she remarries. And Janet's sort of a, an interesting personality because um, she was a nurse and um, she just, she had a good job. She moved to Chicago and had some money in her pocket and saw a billboard that said, birds learn to fly, why can't you? And that set her off on the quest to learn how to fly. But where this story starts is really we're in the heart of the Great Migration. So Cornelius Coffey was born in Arkansas, and when he was young, his mom died, and he moves to Omaha, Nebraska. Um, and when he is a young man, he when he's like a teen, a young teen, he gets the chance to fly with a barnstormer. Um, in a farm field somewhere, and the guy is a white World War One vet who decides he's going to scare the crap out of this little black kid because um, the military and the United States in general did not believe that African Americans were brave enough or smart enough to serve uh, honorably in the military as a soldier or have the wits to fly, despite the fact that Bessie Coleman was doing it in 1924, despite the fact that Eugene Bullard did it in World War One in France. The difference is they both had to leave the country um, to do it. It's amazing if people don't believe in you what you cannot do. You know, and so it's also equally amazing if you believe in yourself, what you can figure out and go do it anyway. I feel like it's a bit like Dumbo with that magic feather, you know, um, you need something to hold on to. And so Eugene Bullard became Bessie Coleman's magic feather. Bessie Coleman became Cornelius Coffey and John C. Robinson and Willow Brown's and Janet Harmon Bragg's um, magic feather. And then they became the feather for other people until people didn't need it anymore. And... Um, so coffee, he, um, doesn't see a future for himself in aviation because the world's against it. So he becomes a, an auto mechanic and, um, he's working in Detroit when, um, he has a client, uh, Dr. Ocean Sweet has this amazing, uh, luxury car that breaks down on the wrong side of town. And Dr. Sweet has it towed to a nearby garage and tells the mechanic on duty there, do not touch my car. I've got a guy and he's going to come and, and work his magic. And that pisses off the mechanic on duty who happens to be John C. Robinson. So <laughs> coffee comes in and Johnny, I, I like to think of him as the, um, you know, the fighting Irish leprechaun for uh, Notre Dame with like the fists up and right. the hat at the rakish angle. I can imagine Johnny like that, like, who do you think you are? And uh, you know, there is precedent for imagining Johnny like this. that is true. There's on the historical record, like the man was not afraid to throw a punch if, if, it, yeah. if, uh, if he felt it was required, but that it didn't come to fisticuffs instead there was a conversation had because they'd both spent time in Chicago. Uh, Co Coffee had to go to Chicago to learn to be an auto mechanic because he couldn't find a school that would teach him uh, elsewhere as a black man. And, um, and Johnny had gone to school at the Tuskegee Institute and, uh, but they'd both been through Chicago and Johnny was headed back. And he said, uh, when they realized they both had an interest in flying, he said, look me up if you ever come back to Chicago and let's see what we can work out. And, Thus, history was made. Um, Coffee 
came back. He actually helped Johnny get a job working at a car dealership where he worked as a as the head mechanic. And um, they start applying for flight schools and nobody will take them. And then they have the idea to um, not check the box that says they're colored. Um, and they get in on their own merits. But the day they go in to sign up for classes in person, it's very clear that they are they are two Negro men and this school is like, we don't take Negroes. We have too many Southern white Southern students who wouldn't want to be in a class with you. And they tried to give them their money back and they refuse. They're like determined to get into this class and they go about it in two different ways. Um, coffee goes to his boss. He mentions like, Oh, they they've got our money, but they won't let us take the class. And his boss says, don't take that money back. I'm going to call a lawyer. They need to accept you. And meanwhile, Johnny. Meanwhile, Johnny, um, who really all his life has a very good image of himself. <laughs> um, <laughs> he's like, right, I'm going to get into this school, whatever way. And uh, as Sheree says, he also has a um, degree in, in um, auto mechanics from Tuskegee Institute. As they're leaving the uh, office of the school, he notices a sign, a little probably handwritten sign that says that they're looking for a janitor. So he thinks, well, you know, they're not going to take a black man as a student. Maybe they'll take him as a janitor. And he went back in, applied for the job, and he got it. So for the next several months, Johnny would time his um, working in the school so that he was basically auditing uh, some of the ground school classes and he'd stand in the back and he'd push his broom and he'd wait afterwards and copy down diagrams from the blackboard and he'd fish paper out of the trash can and check it out. And he was reading presumably the same kind of texts that these guys were, that the students were actually reading. And the instructor of this class who was uh, a man named Jack Snyder and also a World War I uh, flying ace veteran pilot noticed him, was aware of him and uh, was sympathetic to him. So he would, he would ask people, he would ask people a question and if they couldn't answer it, he'd turn to the guy in the back with the broom and say, Mr. Robinson, what, do you have anything you'd like to add? And Johnny would usually know the answer. And, in the meantime, Johnny and Coffee were actually working on their own to learn all they could about aviation. So they had founded a club, basically a social club, that they called the Brown Eagle Study Group. And they would get together on weekends and they'd talk about aviation and they'd read books and they'd discuss what they read. And they also were building a kit plane. They bought a, a Heath parasol. Parasol aircraft which is a one seater with a with a high wing and they put this thing together uh with a henderson motorcycle engine uh to fly it with and the, neither one had ever flown a plane or or had ever taken any kind of a flying lesson but they put this plane together and eventually uh it, you know they kind of done all the tinkering that they could and they thought well it might actually fly but how are we going to find out so johnny went to jack snyder the the instructor and said we've got this plane would you mind coming and taking a look at it and it was kind of a big deal they had to you know they were working on it in a garage and they had to lift it onto a flatbed truck and take it out to a field that would be appropriate for for taxiing around in and so the whole brown eagle aero club turned out and jack snyder came along and gets into this plane starts the engine wait a minute this is a motorcycle engine okay <laughs> starts the engine taxis around and sure enough after a while suddenly he takes off and the plane lifts off the, the grass field and and he flies it very confidently around in circles comes back down to land and so everybody's thrilled and snyder goes back to the director of the school and says look these guys have built their own plane. They know what they're doing. If we don't teach them to fly, they're going to teach themselves. We need to accept them. And uh, the director of the school says, well, 
we might as well take them in because one of them is suing us anyway. So that's how they end up um, taking classes. And they enroll, they graduate the following year with their aviation mechanics degrees. They're both of them top of the class. And at the graduation ceremony, the director of the school says to them, you guys have done a great job. And if you know other black people who want to learn to fly, we are willing to give you a class of your own. You can teach. And you know, if you find them, the class is yours. And that is how they, uh, sure, you remind me what the name of the school was. <laughs> Curtis, the, it's, it, uh, Curtis Wright School of yeah, Aviation. Yeah, and the school's name changed um, midstream there too. Yeah. But they they began to call themselves Aeronautical, Aeronautical University. Right, as if they were the only one. But um, they, right. you know, they start this class and they were telling all their friends, everybody in their club, um, because it hadn't been easy for them. Um, the the school said, you know, you can, you can join this class class um coffee and johnny but if you have any problems with the students you're on your own and so they had problems with other students who would you know sort of block them from getting to the vending machine at snack time and try to prevent them from getting the good tools and until um their teacher jack snyder said you know these guys already have a plane and they are basically they know everything you're going to wish you knew um by the time the test comes around so if i were you i'd be nicer to them and then suddenly everybody was very nice to them and buying them coffee and snacks and so they start this class and um hopefully there'll be an even playing field now right it's a, it's all african american students um all men except for little janet harman bragg the only woman in that first class and now um you know let's talk about the intersectionality of of um minorities and of mistreatment now she's getting the same bum rush that they had gotten from the white students you know people sort of talking down to her because she's just a pretty little lady and what does she know and she doesn't know um a wrench from a screwdriver um that was never uh, something in her upbringing, but she had been a tomboy and she was good at math. Um, she taught herself to drive her dad's car when she was like 10. And that's something that like, I think at least three of our main they characters have in common, have in common yeah. is that they <laughs> t taught themselves how to drive cars when they were like, you know, under the age of 12. Ten. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. But she, um, but what she had was determination, a good head on her shoulders and money. And so she, when they wouldn't share the good tools, she went out and bought herself the shiniest toolbox and the nicest set of tools at Sears. And then they were all like, could I borrow a your? And she'd say, no. Nice. <laughs> and she, um, one night, um, Amelia Earhart visited the school and she came through their class and spoke to Janet and Janet said, you know, this is, this is tough. And Amelia said, that's the way it's going to be for a woman, but stick with it. And mm. she did. And that opened the so, up to more women coming. Yeah, they did. They did have, have several women who graduated from the class. And we focused on, on Will Brown and Janet Bragg, but they had several others over the years who did graduate from that class. I was going to say, we, we've been talking aviation mechanics. We haven't at all been talking about how they actually learned to fly. And uh, Coffee and Johnny were by this time getting flying lessons from uh some white aviators here and there, there were, they did find people that would be willing to teach them. And they were mostly flying from an airfield called acres, which was run by uh, some white people. And they were, they'd been hanging out there for a long time, even before they had actually um, joined the class. And that airfield was scheduled to be um they sold it turned into housing yeah. yeah it was sold and so they had they were hunting around for a place of a new place to fly from and they hit on the idea of building their own airfield they approached the mayor of robbins illinois which was a village that was incorporated as an all-black village so it had its own policemen, its own firemen, uh, the mayor was black, and they negotiated to rent a field from them, which they were going to then clear of brush and turn into an airfield. 
and Janet was kind of their financer. She was she was the one. She was the, still the one with the She's steady the job. Money. Yeah. Um, she was the money. She bought her own plane. They they had they they all they'd moved up. Um, at this point, Coffey did own his own plane. He did a lot of exchanging of his abilities for aircraft and engines. So, you know, he'd offer to fix something for someone and they would give him an engine and he would then fix it up and install it in a plane that needed one. So he, he actually had his own plane at this point, which they were all flying in. None of them had enough credentials, flight credentials to teach. But Johnny eventually, he was the first one of the bunch to get his license and you could teach not for pay. So uh, he was, he was always a little bit operating on the kind of like the shady side of things, you know, as long as, as long as it wasn't technically illegal, he'd do it. Yeah, he'd, he'd teach you for tips. Is the way <laughs> he, right, you know? right, right. Like find some <laughs> other way, an honorarium. Yeah. yeah um, right. <laughs> so he was, so, so they basically built this airfield themselves and the, the, the stories of their, you know, sort of clearing the ground, Janet said the weeds were higher than I I was they had a, um, a boulder in the middle of the field that they could not move they dug and dug and dug and dug trying to get it out and they couldn't move it and eventually they dug a hole around it and just rolled it in dropped it in and covered it up it. Yeah. um they they the the truck that they were using to haul to haul cinders and and timber they built their own hangar as well you often would only go in reverse <laughs> So, they just, you know, the, everything that they did, this was during the Depression, everything they did was kind of, you know, made up and was people helping out. And they got a lot of help from the village itself, who were very enthusiastic about them being there. The hangar that they built was designed by Johnny, who's who drew up the blueprints for it. And they could only work on it when he was there because his handwriting was so <laughs> awful. So, and, and then again, when they, when they got the, when they got the airfield going and they were ready to fly because he was the only one who actually had a license, he hogged the flying. So they'd wait and wait all day waiting for a chance to go up. And then Johnny would go up and, you know, he was the airport manager. He was, he was the guy who, he was at this time, he was the front man. Mm -hmm. And do you know, we we as we were writing as we were researching these people and working on them initially we divided them up i said i wanted to write about the, the, you know this i was the one i was the one who spearheaded this idea i was like i'm going to write about the people i want to write about and i said i'm going to research johnny and willa and you can research coffee and janet and we found as we were as we were working on them that we kind of became Team Coffee and Team Johnny <laughs> because they told different stories. There were different personalities. You know? There were such different personalities. Very different personalities. Coffee was very quiet and unassuming, and Johnny was flashy and brash. Yeah. 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 And what happened over the years, and we, we, we chose these four people because they clearly were interconnected. But what happened over the years is that there was a, a Johnny Coffee split. And it's not real obvious why that happened. But interestingly, when it happened, Willa, who became part of their team because she was enticed by Johnny's terms, we, we kind of think, Willa actually ended up um, working with Coffee and it, indeed even married to him. And Janet did not participate in the school that Coffee and Willa operated, but she did support Johnny in other endeavors. There, do, there doesn't seem to be, there doesn't seem to have been a romantic relationship between, I mean, some people suggest that there was a romantic relationship between Willa and Johnny, but he doesn't seem to have actually been involved with any of the women that that we have written about. I would assume that there was a network of women going, watch out for that Johnny <laughs> Robinson. There were you know? I mean, there, there's this, there's this lovely, lovely picture. He, they both have coffee and, and Johnny apart from, from Willa, who we know that coffee was married to both have very elusive wives. Mm -hmm. And 
one of the women that Johnny seems to have been married to, this picture of her in the Chicago Defender, the, the black newspaper um, that reports all these things, which gave us a lot of the information that, that we drew on. There's a picture of this woman whose name is Ernie's Tate and Johnny, and they're standing beneath the wing of an airplane and they're kind of grinning at each other. It's like 1932, it, during the time when they were all taking flying lessons and they were building this airfield. And he apparently is teaching her to fly. And it's a saucy and, caption too. It's sort of, it implies yeah, that it's it a says, flirtation. It says, yeah, yeah, it says something like Johnny, the way he's looking at her implies that he's enjoying more than just than just teaching her to fly. It's something yeah, like well, that. Yeah, well, those were know? all of the captions that had anything to do with women <laughs> that is at the time. <laughs> but, you know, interestingly, so Willa ends up married to Coffee, which is sort of surprising, right? You've got, like, you could go with Hercules or you could go with the guy holding the, the reins of the horse or whatever she goes with, you know. Yeah. But it... It's very possible that it was completely business related. They were running this flying school together at this time and spending all their time at the airfield. And she wanted to be there. And the only like coffee was living in a trailer there. So he could be there 24 seven. If she wanted to live in that trailer too, she had to be married because <laughs> yeah. otherwise, you know, it would be, it would be frowned upon by society. And so it might've been strictly business I wish to God we could know. I would, yeah. you know, like, yeah. what was that like? Yeah. Because also yeah. none of our four um, heroes ever had children. That was my question. Yeah. 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 They never had children of their own. And so while they might have family members, in fact, we actually just had the privilege of meeting Cornelius Coffey's grand nephew. Um, mm. But other other than, than uh, um, you know, secondary relatives right. um yeah there's nobody to say that like oh yeah mom and dad this or that and yeah and coffee has a mysterious possible first wife um that we, that was one of the surprising things we learned uh at least i learned in doing the research is you know when you live in chicago um just down the lake shore is indiana and there is a town in Indiana that was like the Gretna Green of the Midwest. It was the Vegas of the Midwest. You would get on a party boat and go drink and get married at this town in Indiana so that you could have, you know, full marital privileges. And then you would go back to Chicago on Sunday or Monday and get divorced. Oh, and so, yeah, interesting. <laughs> so now I question anybody who got married in certain counties of Indiana, <laughs> like yeah. in a certain time period. Apparently it was such yeah. a, a gimmick that there was a justice of the peace who was bedridden. He had a man down at the docks bringing couples into his bedroom so he could marry them. Oh, my word. Isn't that funny? And, the, and it, mm -hmm. it ended when the um, judges in Chicago complained. They're like yeah. we're tired of processing all these divorces. Yeah. yeah. So this is like we, we went down a lot of rabbit holes like this. Both of us, I think, spent a lot of time trying to chase down yeah. the 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 mysterious spouses of yeah, these people. Crazy. And you kept you kept finding out these like bizarre local rules and 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 things that people took for granted at the time. Mm. And yeah. I don't know if if, if we if we <laughs> We've been telling we've been telling kind of a chronological story, um, but but well so so let's back it up a little bit about the ladies and, and like yeah. you, I think you talked a little bit about um, Janet but but a little bit more about Willa Brown and how she came to aviation. Um, we didn't do that yet because we were still we were still back at Robbins at the airfield that these yes, guys okay, built, fair. and it, that didn't actually last very long. Uh, it after they've been they've been flying there for about a year and a half. And there was a windstorm. There's actually a tornado, although it didn't it didn't come through Robbins. But the high winds that day took down the the hangar that they'd built and that Johnny had designed and threw their planes everywhere and uh, really trashed two of them. Uh, Janet's plane they were able to repair, but it wasn't flyable, you know, immediately. And they basically uh, started looking for a new place to fly. And where they ended up was a place called Harlem Airfield, which is not in Harlem, New York. It's in Harlem, Chicago. Uh, it's in, um, what's the name of the actual town? I cannot. Har Harvey? No, it's not no, Harvey. No, I can't remember. 
It's it's what it's one of these little towns that's now been subsumed in the Chicago yeah. suburbs, mm -hmm. and it was at the corner of of Harlem and, and uh, 80, 87th yeah. Street, I think. Yeah. And so there was it was also run by a white guy who said to them. Uh, they they encountered him in some of their flying before, and he said, "Yeah, come on, your 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 field is no longer flyable. You can fly from our field. You can fly from the other end of the runway. You won't mix with the other guys. Um, I mean, the white guys. There's a hangar you can have. Yeah, the other yeah. white guys. Um, so that they did have trouble." Getting along there as well, uh, the hang the hangar that they had been given mysteriously burned down. Uh, the airfield owner built them another hangar, but eventually things settled down there and actually settled down enough that they started having um, integrated air shows that were sponsored by the airport managers there. Uh, quite possibly the first the first ones of their kind, which were very, very well attended. There were thousands of people, yeah. mixed audiences coming coming to watch. And men and women participating, black and white participating. And, and this is in important the 1930s. that we hear about when we hear about Bessie Coleman, because I think there were times when she was not going to be allowed to perform in front of black audiences and she wasn't having it. Is that true? That, that that yeah. is that yeah. is true. That that was ten years right. earlier yeah. as well. Um, so the fact that they didn't have to fight right. to to have she this, you know, that sort trail. Of, yeah, yeah, yeah. So so Willa uh, was uh, she had a degree in business administration. She lived in Gary, Indiana, and she was teaching at a high school there. She was she was teaching business at a high school there. And she eventually moved to Chicago and was involved in, with another teacher. She may or may not have been engaged to him. And in any case, they were going steady. And she took him home with her to uh, meet her parents for Mother's Day. And on the way back to Chicago, they were in, both involved in a terrible car accident, which killed him. And Willa may have been driving, but she was also very badly injured. And it was in the aftermath of this accident that she was not really doing the work, that, not capable in body and maybe not in spirit either of doing the work that she had been doing. She was working at a, a lunch counter, which happened to be the place where the now calling themselves the Challenger Aero Club, Coffee and his crowd were hanging out when they were not flying. And she overheard them talking. She started chatting to them. Johnny Robinson put blues on her, probably. And uh, he said, you know, why don't you come out and join us and, and I can teach you to fly. And so she did go out and join them. And he did probably give her her first flying lessons. And she also enrolled at Aeronautical University and got an aviation. I think that was another one of her first. For, uh, no, Janet, Janet must have finished be her first, degree yeah. before. Yeah. yeah. But she was the, she um, was the uh, secret sauce, I think, to our group because she, yeah. um, like Johnny, she had a flair for showmanship, but she also had business acumen that I would say none of them had. And none of them, yeah. So she knew how to drum up business when they started their air shows. Um, it was her idea. She put on her white flying job purse and, and her full flying kit and stormed the offices of the Chicago Defender. And, you know, she was beautiful. She looked like Lena Horne. And she went in there, hands on, you know, did the Wonder Woman stance and is like, I want to talk to someone about our flying club. And the male reporters, you know, fell over themselves to be the one she spoke to. And <laughs> Enoch Waters won. And she sat down with him and explained what they were doing. And he had had no idea that there were black aviators in Chicago. And um, he started a whole movement with the newspaper to support their endeavors and spread the word because, you know, there was like a, a, a black newspaper wire like the Associated mm -hmm. Press. And um, so these stories would then go out across the country about what was happening in Chicago. So he also, he was the guy who came up with the idea for them to nationalize their organization. 
And the reason he did that was because his publisher, who indeed was Robert S. Abbott, the guy who'd sponsored Bessie Coleman to go and do her flying in France, the, the publisher couldn't quite justify giving these guys free advertising, as it were. But if they were a national organization, he could because they were then promoting uh, aviation throughout the United States and aviation for black people throughout the United and States. And Abbott had a real and, you know, desire to uplift the race by by spreading yeah. word of good, good and amazing, impressive deeds. Yeah. And the timing of this was really a, kind of a perfect storm because now we're at, now we're kind of edging to the end of the 1930s the the National Air, Airmen's Association of America was founded in 1939 you will the date of World War II you know it's also the beginning of World War II in Europe 1939 and the US of course was very very much aware that it might end up at war. Now they didn't want to be at war. They had neutrality acts in effect. They were they were doing their darndest not to get involved with, with Europe's problems, but they knew that they might end up going to war. And looking toward the future with that in mind, there were a couple of aviation bills that were being put forward in Congress. And one of them was to create the civilian pilot training program, which would basically provide government funded pilot training to licensed to the stage of being licensed so you would you would have a private pilot's license at the end of it and therefore they would create a whole bunch of jobs for people to become instructors for more planes to be built and they would have a core of people who were ready to be trained to be combat pilots should the country go to war. Now the civilian pilot training program had no, there was, there was nothing in it that guaranteed that black pilots would be included in the program. And so our group basically with using the national, um, a, oh God, what are they called? National Airmen's Association of America, using that as their front they started lobbying to um, have something included in this bill that would guarantee that black people would also be able to fly. They were lobbying earlier and, than 1939. I think they started. Yes, in, they were. They were. 30, they were lobbying before yeah. that. The, the The program was that sort of basic version of the program was rolled out in 1938, which had one black aviator involved in it and that was because he was already enrolled at a school that had a flight program it was a white school that had a flight program but there was nothing in it to guarantee that there yeah. would ever be any more so they were lobbying before that um but in may of 1939 they decided kind of you know as a as a big gesture um they would they would hit the halls of washington themselves and they called this, that this was going to be a goodwill flight. Two of their number, Chauncey Spencer and Dale White, were going to participate and they were gonna fly from Chicago to Washington. And this, I can't emphasize what a big deal it was to, to make that kind of a flight in those days. It was, it was gonna take them you know, several days if they went straight there and they weren't planning to go straight, straight there. They were going to stop at colleges and, and fly clubs along the way and talk to people and help, you know, drum up some support for these, for these bills. And they, so off they went, they got a not lot of that press easy. coverage. Not that easy. They, they did were not set. They, oh yeah, that's it's true. That they, didn't, they, they, didn't, they, they, they didn't. They had to raise money first. They had to, they had to get plane. a plane first. They rented the I, I, sorry, I keep trying to kind of like you know <laughs> jump ahead, <laughs> and I forget about all the. I mean, nothing is ever all, easy. All the joy that went right? into nothing it. is no. ever easy. So they were fundraising to rent a plane, and they still didn't have enough money. And Chauncey Spencer is crying about it at work one day, and one of the women said, "Well, why don't you ask the Jones brothers, who were um, they were policy." makers which is basically gambling they ran like this lottery like system in uh the black 
uh, neighborhood of Chicago known as Bronzeville. And, and they also ran a department store. And so he went down to the department store hat in hand and the Jones brothers, these, you know, these, you know, low level gangsters basically gave them the money, gave them an extra thousand dollars to go do the thing. And, um, and they thanked them later on by flying over their house and dropping flowers on the doorstep from an airplane to, oh, to say cute. thank you. That's but great. so they raised the money, they rent this plane that is not the best plane in the world it is the plane that it, they can afford um which means that they have a big fanfare they take off and they break down in indiana like you know a state away <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah so um coffee and another guy have to drive out with like the piece that needs to be repaired the townspeople so this white township is like who are these black men fell from the sky <laughs> who are these people but they put them up and took good care of them uh -huh. they get their plane repaired and they plan on coming back to that town one day and putting on an air show which they do to like thank the people for their good care okay. so by hook or by crook they've got no lights on this plane they um but they're running behind schedule they're forced to land in the dark by following another plane which of course is dangerous and illegal and they almost get thrown in jail for that um actually the the reason that they end up flying at night in the dark is because when they landed in morgantown west virginia the that says the, it all west yeah, virginia the airport <laughs> there the people at the airport there said now nah, you can't stay here yeah I, I, it's not it's not on record where they said you're black you can't stay here but that was certainly the implication and they made them take off again despite the fact that they had no wow. lights so they kind of hopped into pennsylvania where they were then held up for um not landing legally of course but they, they got bailed out by the by the editor of uh the the local black paper Pittsburgh courier yeah. That, another that black network, paper yeah. who who also gave them another chunk of money to, oh, great. to keep them That's, going that, yeah i'm yeah. so impressed yeah. by these two. like i i'll be honest i didn't know that history um what brought me to it was um our friend carol hobson's book about bessie coleman and just the mm -hmm. importance of the the black newspapers at the time and the network that they established yeah incredible. yeah they yeah. really did yeah. But, you know, the sort of the triumphant ending of this um, <laughs> this uh, odyssey to D.C. is that they get there and they have a contingent of people that they're meeting with. And um, they are um, underneath the Capitol building. There is like a little railway station, a little subway. To the, this was one of the things this is one of the rabbit holes that I thought was so dang cool. It was built in 1909, an electric subway system beneath the Capitol wow. building. Just to wow. take you from one end to the other for votes quickly. And they're yeah. walking down there and who should be coming the other way, but a young Senator from Missouri named Harry S. Truman. And so they, they're trying to tell everybody who they can, like, please vote to put, you know, black schools into this program. And he's interested in what they're doing. And he says, can I see your plane? And they are like, absolutely. And so he goes out to the airfield and he takes a look at this plane that has been clearly stuck together with gum and tape. And he says, if you guys are brave enough to fly that thing, I'm brave enough to try to help you get what you want. That's so cool. And, and he does. And that was a relationship that um, had great significance for the whole nation because after World War II in 1948, Harry S. Truman is the president who desegregates the United States military. And then it also leads to the Tuskegee's, right? T to the airmen who actually went off to World War II. Yes. So the civilian pilot training program there were eventually there were there were thousands of schools across the united states that were involved in it so they're all being given federal funding to do this pilot training and there were six black colleges and the coffee school of aviation which was not in associated with the college that they were they were kind of treated as an experiment the whole way through but they throughout the existence of the civilian pilot training program so including when the nation went to war and it became the war training service, the coffee school was being given funded and involved in pilot training. And eventually they were training pilots who would go on to Tuskegee. They had a, they had a very stormy relationship with Tuskegee, which is partly responsible, I think, for the, the rift between Johnny and coffee. Johnny was a Tuskegee alum and 
throughout the 1930s, and this is kind of like a part of the a thread of the story that we haven't actually touched on in, in this talk, but which we do touch on in the book, um, throughout, the, throughout the 1930s, Tuskegee was thinking about um, an aviation program. They really weren't own. thinking about an aviation program until Johnny said, you should think about an aviation program, and they poo-pooed it. And then they didn't poo poo it. They, they in didn't the very it. beginning, they, they poo pooed they, it. They, they were just like, they were like, yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe. It maybe. seemed like a fad. But they kept, they kept saying, come to Tuskegee, Johnny, and teach this aviation program. And he kept saying, after I do this other fancy thing, um, he went off to Ethiopia and they said, no, we'll hold your job for you. We'll hold your job for you. And then he came back and they said, now are you going to, now are you going to teach your aviation program? He goes, no, now I want to open the John Robinson school of aviation. He wanted, and I want you to sponsor yeah. it. He wanted and more money. Like, mm, he wanted that's not our more plan. fame and they wouldn't give yeah. it to him. But like the real thing yeah. is he and coffee and another guy um, flew down in two planes. They were going to go to Tuskegee for like a, an alumni event and be like, ta-da, this is what aviation can be for black people. And um, Johnny is rather pigheaded and not listening to coffee. And so he, <laughs> he ends up wrecking their plane. Yeah. And so to coffee and oh, who was flying with them in the bullpup? Um, I can't remember his name, but the other fellow who was with them, they end up giving him the other guy's little plane to make it to Tuskegee late while they're stuck in this town uh, waiting to repair their own plane and pay for the damage to the field that they crashed mm -hmm. in. Mm -hmm. And so Johnny gets down there and it's funny. Coffee was like, you know, we never did convince Tuskegee to like do a flying thing with us. <laughs> and maybe we would have, if we hadn't have crashed that plane. But um, yeah. so, you know, Johnny was pretty brash and they weren't interested. And then Tuskegee is in Alabama and it's a Southern school coffee and Johnny and them were all about integration and Tuskegee was not. Right. Um, and so what happened was when they were lobbying for who would get when they finally the Tuskegee Airmen um, uh, program, the, which was also called the Tuskegee Experiment at the time, when it finally ha has a possibility of happening, everyone is lobbying to be the place, including the coffee school. And Tuskegee won probably because they were willing to segregate. So that was very heartbreaking for the for our aviators, but it also yeah. it advanced um, blacks in aviation, black people in aviation, but not in the leap that it yeah. would have been if it had yeah. if it had ended up in Chicago instead. Yeah. Their 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 president, uh, Tuskegee's president, who who wrote uh, big long um, unpublished. Uh, kind of a diary really about the the Tuskegee program actually says that in making their bid to uh, the federal government to have the the combat program rolled out at Tuskegee they thought it might be comforting that it was in a segregated state yeah, that that was the word he totally used. kowtowed to the prevailing mm -hmm. fears of the white segregated military, yeah. and yeah. and uh, you know that was really heartbreaking for people who'd been fighting for equality. Um, but at the same time, you can't deny that it allowed the program no, that, to happen, and the program itself had all right. kinds of challenges. But um, right. uh, Coffee School ended up training a lot of. They had their own CPTP program, and so they're training people through that program to become instructors at the program, so that they can go from basic to advanced training. Mm -hmm. And um, and then those people are getting hired away by Tuskegee, who needs them to teach the military people. One of the interesting things that is um, Janet Harmon Bragg. So when the war starts up and the war footing happens, um, all of the sort of private schools, well, the coffee school shut down. It converted to be this CPTP program. Um, she started her own flight school for a while, but in order to get training, she actually ended up going down to Tuskegee 
and getting some of her advanced training down mm-hmm. there. She'd maintained, big, through Johnny, she'd maintained a really good relationship with Tuskegee. She, she'd helped. They When they won their bid for flight training, they did not have their own airfield. And so they were doing fundraising all over the country for money to build an airfield for Tuskegee. Yeah. And Janet had, both Janet and Johnny had been very much involved in this, and, you yeah. know, were giving speeches around mm-hmm. the country. And, and helping to fundraise for it. So she had, she knew the people there. She had a good relationship with them. And when she needed further training, that was the obvious place for her. And obviously, to go. there were only so many African American pilots um, at, of that caliber. So uh, one guy, Charles Chief Anderson, they nicknamed him Chief. He was running the program down at Tuskegee, and she had mm-hmm. met him. He'd visited the um, coffee school before, and um, so she reached out to him and was like, "I need this training. Can you help me?" And he was like absolutely come on down and um really funny um where tuskegee uh where the airfield was was in a dry county and so she became a bootlegger for a little while she would fly to the next county and they would load up her plane with booze and she had she had instructions from the soldiers there yes yeah she was (laughs) she had instructions from the soldiers they 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 had some sort of signal and she was supposed to dump it all into a lake if if um the coast was not clear that's awesome <laughs> she had no idea how she was going to do that while she was flying the plane at the same time. Unfortunately, she never had to. Yeah. Well, what else is there to the story that you want to share before I start digging in on a couple of little sidebars that I remembered I'm um, hearing you talk about? I, I was going to say I, th- I I feel like I feel like we should sort of like tie up. Yeah. But you know, because here we are in the war and they're doing all this teaching and training and. When Sheree and I were writing this, we imagined that originally when we when we sort of planned out how we how we were going to tell this story, we imagined it as a flight. And so each each chapter was going to be, you know, sort of like groundwork, take off, cruise. We had turbulence. turbulence. Yeah, turbulence with the war <laughs> chapters, you know. Right. But we found that when we when we got to when when the war was over, really it, it, with the with not even just with the war being over, but really with the with the end of the what had been the civilian pilot training program became the, the war training service that ended before the end of the war. And that was really the end of the the sort of the momentum that they had in terms of of this working together that they've been doing for so many years and although they all kept flying they were not doing it together and willa for example uh divorced coffee we're not sure when she went off and moved to um uh, another town where she became very involved in the church and married a minister there. And she wasn't flying. She, you know, she was involved in her church work. She got her license back when she was in her sixties. And she was inspired to do that because she'd read a book about the civilian pilot training service. Uh, you know, a historical book. Um, so, so that was Willa uh, off doing her own thing um, elsewhere. And Janet became involved in a different, she was no longer flying either. But Janet but had like a whole through, career. Like Janet, because she was she still a nurse, career. she started running her own um, uh, retirement homes and nursing homes. And so, and she remarried and they had this business together, but because she had maintained this relationship with Johnny, um, she was a known name for Ethiopian students coming to the United States. And she ends up becoming like an honorary auntie to all of these um, Ethiopian students coming to, and she even gets to meet the emperor of Ethiopia. And then eventually is invited to Ethiopia to tour the place and visit all of her, you know, her honorary nephews. Um, And Johnny had, um, he'd, he'd done this flying in Ethiopia in the 1930s. He actually, at the end of the war, went back to Ethiopia and he lived the rest of his life there. He was killed in a a 
flying accident in in 1954. Mm. But from he lived the last the last nine years of his life in Ethiopia, um, doing various aviation related things out there. Um, so so they all really after the the war ended. They went very, very different ways. And Coffey, actually, he ended up teaching um, aviation in uh, Chicago High School. He sort of helped convince them to start a training program for young people. And so he taught for many years. And um, Coffey is funny. He was the oldest of them, you know, firstborn and lived the longest. And he was flying into his 90s. And um, he taught until retirement age. Um, and then he was still, it's funny, there's like a whole file of receipts because he still trained people and would do their tests, run their tests. And he had all these receipts for like repairs and things that he meticulously kept in his later years. And, um, and then there was a bit of a renaissance for them in the starting in the 80s. Um, where people started remembering their legacy. And so the Smithsonian had a traveling uh, exhibit called Black Wings, and they brought whoever they could find surviving um, aviators from that period to um, to speak and do different events um, around the country. And so you'll see Coffey and Janet in particular, those two popping up with um, uh, several other people, Chief Anderson and um, the Smithsonian actually interviewed them oh, on video, good. which is incredible to have. And um uh, let's see. I'd, I'd say one of the last sort of crowning things for coffee was Midway um, Airport in South Chicago named an approach after him. So there's the coffee fix. Um, oh, I love that. And now, just just last year, just uh, in, in 2023, he was inducted into the, uh, is it the, the National, National Aviation Hall of yep, Fame? Yeah, the National Aviation Hall of Fame, finally, after, you know. A really long, long career as um, an aviator. He was he was acknowledged in that way, and so, um, you know. And then the other little tidbit that um, we add in the book um, is is sort of the next generation, right? There was the sky, and then there is outer space, yeah. and um, so the little connection to our people is that the town of Robbins, Illinois, where they built their first. Um, airstrip and had to bury the boulder. The mayor was a guy named Samuel Nichols. He had a daughter named Nichelle, who was, uh, uh, she's she, got was she was born. She was born the year that they were flying there. Oh my gosh. So she goes on, she was a singer and dancer. She used to perform as a teenager in mm -hmm. Chicago at cabarets and things. And she goes on to become an actress. And then we all know and adore her as Lieutenant Uhura from Star Trek. And um, in her later years, she became an ambassador for NASA mm -hmm. and um, was helping them with recruitment and promoting things. Um, and she had stuck with Star Trek because she was going to quit after a couple of years in Star Trek. And Martin Luther King um, met her at an event and told her he was a fan and that, um, you know, that the black community needed her to stay on that show because it opened up such horizons for people. Mm -hmm. And so she was paying that forward as an ambassador to NASA. And she is the person who contacted um a woman who had applied to be an astronaut and been rejected. Um, she reached out and said, would you please apply again? And that woman was Mae Jemison, who became our first black female astronaut. That's beautiful. That is a, a, a beautiful circle right there. I love that story so much. It is. Um, it's really, it's about community. I think that's the thing that strikes me the most about this book. It's about what a community could do. So finding your community yeah. and all pulling in the yeah. same direction is incredibly powerful. Yeah, it is incredibly powerful. Um, however, there was like a, a little bit of a sad part of that. Um, when, when you spoke, Cherie, you talked about your brother, you guys growing up in Chicago and, and being right there. Talk a little bit about that. Ah, so uh, I was born in Chicago, moved away when I was a baby, but I was back there eighth grade through high school. My brother was there for high school. My brother was a kid who um, 
he built model rockets and model airplanes like his entire childhood and um he was a math science major in high school and his aspiration he did end up going to the university of illinois in champaign urbana um and majoring in aeronautical and astronautical engineering um but I was stunned in researching this book to realize that Coffey and Janet and Willa, they were all in Chicago at the time that we were in Chicago in school, and we never heard about them. Mm. Never heard about them. And, uh, and also in doing the research, I discovered that another um, early black aviator, William Powell, he was the first black man to graduate from the engineering school at the University of Illinois in Champaign. And um, my brother went there for four years and never heard of him. Mm. And so when I was working on the book, I asked him, I said, what would it have done for you to know about this legacy? He said it would have changed everything. Mm. There are studies that show that students that are taught that there were trailblazers that looked like them, uh, that were from similar backgrounds, they do better in school knowing that they are standing on those shoulders. And so we do a huge disservice when we hide these accomplishments and we forget about this history. So I wish that um, I wish that he'd known um, back then, and I'm glad that he knows now. My dad also he wanted to be a pilot, um, but he he when he served in the military he he wore glasses, so he wasn't allowed to um, learn to fly. But he did go for his private license um, in later years, and. Um, you know, I just I wonder, like the world would have been a different place. You know, the world would have been a different place. My dad could have learned to fly with Cornelius Coffee. You've done so much for this history. Why do, why do you think we kind of lost track of it? Why do you think it gets buried in the in the crevices? You know, a part of it is because Coffee is a very unassuming guy. He he. You know, maybe if Johnny had lived 50 years later, he'd have been blowing his own horn out there. But um, I, I, Bessie Coleman died in 1926. Mm -hmm. I, I think he gets buried because, you know, things just drop away from us. And there's that I run into stuff all the time that I thought was very important or or you know, incidents that that were important in my childhood or in my teenage years. And nobody re nobody remembers them anymore. The, the younger generation has their own issues that are pressing. Um, that's kind of my guess is that these guys were quiet trailblazers. They did the work they had to do. Uh, you know, OK, so they flew to Washington and it was all over the black newspapers. But then a war happened mm. and they were working to do what they needed to do to, you know, pro train pilots for that. And, and they weren't that the, the newspapers stories drop off after they start their successful school. Because, you know, every now and then it says something like the school was closed for a week because they haven't got the right runway mm -hmm. light, you know, but but they're not so much reporting about the achievements of the hundreds of students that they're sending through and then sending on to train as military. Pilots. And I've got a different take on that. I think it is um, silencing by the majority. Um I know that, you know, when the Tuskegee Airmen, there was a propaganda film called Wings for This Man that was narrated by Ronald Reagan, actually. And it was one of those black and white films showing black pilots and wow. and saying, like, wow. you know, look at what we're doing. Only shown in black theaters in black townships. So white America, right. which was the majority and still is didn't know anything about it. In my research on the Tuskegee Airmen, I remember reading a story of a woman who mentioned in her history class in college, like, oh, my dad was a pilot in World War II, this African-American woman, and her teacher accused her of lying. There were no black pilots. I came across this with the Women's Air Force Service Pilots um, research I did for Fly Girl, that my, I started that book as a master's thesis, and my, um, my advisor, um, when I told him what the book was about, he said, Shri, I served in World War II. I've never heard of these women. So 
when the WASP program closed, all those women were expected to go back to the kitchen, go back to being wives, and um, and the handful of outspoken ones became bush pilots in Alaska. Yeah. When um, when you think about the end of World War One, um, African Americans had served with distinction in Europe, the Harlem Hellfighters in World War One, and their reward. Um, coming back to the United States was in 1919 was Red Summer. They were killed. Their houses were burned down because America was terrified by the image of a an organized group of black men that knew how to use guns. And so there's no reward for success in the eyes of the majority. And so you keep quiet about things. Yeah. There's that, there's a parable that I guess I probably shouldn't say, but, um, uh, cause there's an explanation. It's the story of a bird is flying South for, um, winter and it's flying late and it's freezing cold. It gets caught in the storm and it just freezes. It falls to the ground in a barnyard and it thinks it's going to die. And, um, a cow comes along and doesn't notice the bird at all, but the cow takes a, a, a dump on the bird and uh, it it melts the ice warms the bird up and the bird is so happy starts to sing and the barnyard cat hears it scoops it out of the uh, manure and eats it and the you know the the moral of that story is those who crap on you aren't necessarily your enemies those who pull you out of crap aren't necessarily your friends and if you're warm and happy in a pile of crap keep your mouth shut And so I think (laughs) there is something to be said there that progress was being made. Also, these are not the people that were, um, you know, women and minorities weren't ending up in the history books back then. Mm -hmm. I know of WASP who started speaking about the history when they discovered that it wasn't being taught in the history books. Mm -hmm. And I think probably African-Americans assumed it wasn't going to be taught in the history books. Mm -hmm. So they weren't keeping... Um, you know, diaries, they were making their, their way through life. They were living, they weren't building historical legacy because uh, there's a lot of erasure to yeah. that historical legacy. So I think that's part of it too, is that um, they did what they came to do. It might've lived on in smaller communities, but, and then it is time and tide, right? Like mm-hmm. somebody dies out. Yeah, and, I, I, yeah. no, I, I think you're right, Sheree. I, I th- but I think it's both. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's a combination. And, and unfortunately, unfortunately, it's one of these things that like, if it, it might not be as bad if it was just the one, but with both those things at work. Yeah. yeah. It's just going to get lost. Yeah. I mean, think of, yeah, there's so much that we've lost. But, you know, the plus side is, like, that means we get to write another book, right? Like, we keep, <laughs> <laughs> right? The we are in, business, in business. Keep burying yeah. those fun and fascinating <laughs> facts from history because they will go find them and bring them to light. And you both do that so well. What do you hope that this book accomplishes now that it's published? For me, I hope that um, I hope that it inspires people. I remember with Fly Girl, um, I was doing a signing at the Air and Space Museum in DC, and there was um, these two adult women pushing their mom towards me, mm-hmm. and uh, and I was like, "What are you afraid of?" Right? Like kid lit authors don't bite, and she, um, they said she wanted to be a pilot. And she sort of, she never achieved that dream and we want to encourage her again. And, you know, I signed a copy of the book to her and encourage her. And it was just wonderful to see her light up. And so I hope that this book lights some people up and that that light guides them to go pursue whatever dream it is, whether it's in aviation or astronautics or something completely different, just like, um, yeah, just inspire them to do the thing. Yeah, I, I can't really add to that. Yeah. <laughs> I want to know a little bit about, about how you put this together. But before we go there, I just want to, um, you know, if, if, yeah, if anybody who is just kind of interested in the aviation history and not how the story got written, then um, they can move along. But I just want to mention a couple of things. First of all, had I been tracking this book, and it's entirely my fault, when um, we were making our decisions about books that we would do for the Aviatrix Book Club this year, I absolutely would have chosen it for this month for, uh, you know, uh, uh, Black History Month. But 
you know, just in general to celebrate this history, this important history, any time of the year. Um, so I'm glad that I have the chance to talk to you. Everybody go buy the book because it is readable for everyone. It's, uh, you know, it's shelved as a young adult book. And so every once in a while I'm reading it and I'm, I get reminded that you're explaining something to me as if I might be a teenager and not have, exp not have a whole career in aviation. And not, and not be like a retired yeah, exactly. but, but it's, 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 I'm surprised when I get to that because I'm like, oh yeah, I'm reading a young adult book. This is a great read for any age. Uh, so informative. Um, I also love the way that like, I love being surprised by things that I learn about in history and reading books that feature, I say this all the time that reading books that feature women in aviation open a portal for me in ways that I might not get not go dig down that history myself and I and I just want to say this Elizabeth about both this book and I am still enjoying um, the audio book Black Dove White Raven um, and this history of Ethiopia was just so surprising I mean I've studied like different parts of Africa for a variety of like sort of more national security and, and post-colonial crises and stuff like that and just never got into the history in Ethiopia and and the connection of the blacks in the united states that history so thank you for the way that you do that for us and i just want to say that the aviatrix book club is discussing stateless this month which is yeah. also by elizabeth ween and so much fun it's such a great great read and um i look forward to hope, hopefully seeing you in the discussion at the end of the month on sunday <laughs> I got I got Cherie to blurb stateless. Yeah, now it's so yeah, <laughs> now you've got a little love fest going on. So that's a great yeah. book. And then you had to go get who was it, Jacqueline Brown to <laughs> blurb? Oh, uh, Jackie Woodson. Yeah, Jacqueline, Jacqueline Woodson. Woodson. Yes, yeah. Jacqueline Woodson. Yeah, to blurb yeah, which is pretty amazing. special. Pretty special. Yeah, and a whole bunch of other really... really great people on the back of this book. So that's yeah, amazing. I was astonished at like how many people were willing to step up and and blurb they came this out book. In it's yeah, I'm really grateful. Really good. Well, so you shared that you guys actually had not physically met in person until you started actually writing this book. Talk about that a little bit. We'd met on Zoom. We had written some preliminary material for the book, uh, and we needed to kind of up our game. And we planned to have a working week together uh, in the fall of 2022. And so we did, we met in the middle, um, Sheree lives in California, I live in Scotland. Um, we met up in Pennsylvania um, at my family home and we spent a week there, um, <laughs> like, you know, pulling, <laughs> pulling together everything that we'd, that we, that we'd done. And <laughs> the, the, the sort of, the, the story is that we both, because we'd, we'd been working on this thing for like three years already by the time we actually met from from the time that we started pitching it to the time right. that we met was about three years and the pandemic was right. in there you know it wasn't meant to be that right. long <laughs> but but we both were kind of like oh gee she must think i was such a waster we we both had this impression that we weren't getting anything done and that when we presented whatever it was we had done to the other person they must surely be looking at it going really <laughs> and, and and what was so nice about getting together was that we kind of realized that we were both being very cautious about the other person and worrying too much and that we were actually on a level um where we both we both were procrastinating equally <laughs> but also <laughs> being also productive we, equally yeah. yeah also being equally productive uh in different ways i i hasten to add um one of the things that getting together really really i think highlighted for us was how differently we work um because sheree is a plotter and i am a pantser so Shuri, Shuri had all these very careful outlines and very detailed outlines, you know, timeline. And it was, she was the one who, you know, came up with the, with all the different chapter titles and, and, and did the, the, you know, we had to do a lot of outlining before we were able to actually um, pitch this book. And I, meanwhile, I'm like, okay, I'm just going to write this. I got all this, this pile of research here and I'm just going to write it all down. 
Um, and maybe I'll get somewhere at the end. And I just don't know <laughs> how you do that because you're so meticulous too. Like it's one thing if you're well, doing it broadly. Because I make all these little notes to myself. Yeah. I make all the, 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 the notes are all in there. And if I didn't do that, I would have no idea. Yeah. Whereas I, like I, I, I described it as a murder wall. I had like sheets of paper, like I had a full outline and I was trying to do a timeline because that's the thing that's always sort of kicked me in the teeth in revision in historical fiction is that you then realize that your timeline is wonky somewhere and like uh, the story that you think is working so beautifully actually doesn't work. So getting the chronology yeah. right and then like trying to yeah. move those pieces every time you got more information. And this Elizabeth was great at is that like you'd have to judge where you thought this happened when Elizabeth would be like, but you know, over here it says this date, here it says this date, and here it says this date. So we would triangulate. And um, so I had this thing that I taped it on my wall um, uh, so I could visually see it. And my husband walked into my office and was like, what are you doing? And I'm like, I'm following <laughs> timelines and seeing the future. You know, it was like, it was a crazy making thing. So when you're, when you're writing, I mean, it can be messy, right? It's like trying to make Thanksgiving dinner and tell everybody stay out of the kitchen. I don't want you to see what this is going to look like till it's done. But then when you're writing with a partner, you're like, okay, you get to see how the sausage is made. You have to look at this. And yeah. that's sort of embarrassing, you know, <laughs> like you don't want yeah. anybody to see yeah. it. Yeah. 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 Um, so that's that so was cute. very intimidating, but um, then, yeah. So that was like the beauty of being together in Pennsylvania is like, we'd sort of, you know, we got to see each other in our pajamas and like mm -hmm. be human beings and know that we're both working really hard towards the same goal. And, um, and, you know, blessing of blessings that we actually like each other and we get along. You know? <laughs> I was going to say for you guys to go through that I guess together, we lucky. like to have a work relationship like that when you hadn't had any kind of relationship before and to get through the whole thing and come out on the other end appearing at least to the public that you still like each other <laughs> congratulations that's awesome thank you i i mean i think i think if we had really not rubbed that uh, like if we really rubbed each other the wrong way You'd you know if, if we hadn't gotten along i think we probably could have written a book together i think we're pro professional okay, enough right. that we could have gone Ugh. God, well, okay, well, I'm just going to do this. You know, I, I, I think, I think it could have happened. It probably wouldn't have been yeah. as good. Yeah. And we probably wouldn't have been able to go and talk to those schools. Yeah. Together. It would not have been as fun. I think yeah. that's the thing is that yeah, it, it ended up being as fun. fun. And so it's, it is like a gift of the, from the book and it's a, a yeah. bonus, but, um, cause I actually would hesitate to write with somebody that I was friends with because yeah, then I don't know that I could be honest about what I right. think is working and not working on right. the page. And in fact, I've avoided working with other people because I'm like, oh, I don't <laughs> want to go through that. So um, yeah, it doesn't always work, but this worked really well. So you guys, like where, at what point was this being pitched to and to whom? Like you, I know Elizabeth have an agent, Cherie, do you, I like how, did it, mm -hmm. how does that work? How do you navigate that? And when does it start going out to hopefully find a publisher our agents worked together okay we we pitched the book to my nonfiction editor and to sheree's editor yeah. and let yeah, them duke it out got a better <laughs> we, we let them duke it out which they did and like <laughs> sheree's editor won I like it a lot. <laughs> but the way it worked like elizabeth had sent me um sort of a little um a little write up of what the book would be. Yeah. And then we decided to um like I really enjoy writing pitches. And so we were we, we had a Zoom call, didn't we? Yeah, before I think you, we before you put yeah, that together. We talked yeah. about it and then like I made it sexy, right? And like and then we gave it some structure. You did actually you did a really good job. I like doing it. She's good at this kind of I stuff. I like doing yeah. it. Yeah. And so <laughs> you know, um and then that's what we went out with. Yeah. And um and yeah, we, and we gave it, we handed it to the agents mm -hmm. who were working together and they gave us feedback. I think they liked it. I think they liked it from the start yeah, and then so they, funny. and then we went back and forth and then, um, yeah. And we got offers in and we, we chose one and then we were off the, and running. As I recall, the contract was, was a little different from 
like a, a contract that either one of us would have because it talked about how the fees were going to be split. Right. Um, yeah. But apart from that, it was pretty straightforward. Well, yeah. see, so this is the thing that I, you know, I've said it a few times, but I just can't emphasize enough. So like I have different, I, obviously I kind of, since I'm dealing with books that feature women in aviation primarily, um, they uh, run the gamut of authors and genres. And so I get, so in my, and, and then you guys are like my Venn diagram overlap, right? Because I'm, you know, I have the, my master of fine arts in writing for children and young adults. And you guys are like icons in that community. And then I have my aviation community where obviously we have our own icons who, some of whom I've, I've had the pleasure of interviewing. So this is the thing to emphasize to our pilot friends friends who maybe don't know who you are is that this is like having two of the the best known um people in writing for children and young adults and you bring your credibility in the kidlet world as well as the canon that you've each built up of this having written in aviation before and obviously have found an audience for it. And so for you to take that to an editor and then to snatch it up, I mean, that's just a huge um, favor to our community for the visibility of, of black history and aviation, because many, many people could have written the story and it may not have held, you know, gotten where it can get because you two wrote it together. I, I think that part of the success that we have had in terms of pitching and, and publishing this story, well, I'm writing it, is the fact that we both have a, built a career Correct. already mm -hmm. in writing. Yep. Um, so we know who to go yep. to. We have people behind yep. us. We know what we have to do in order to, you know, it's not, it, it, it's, it, it, the whole publication process is not a mystery, although it can be a conundrum. So, you know, we know what, we know what the process is going to be. There are sticking points throughout the process. And, and we did run into those. Um, and we, and we still run into that, but because we have been so long, both of us involved in publishing i think it feels less mysterious to us mm. than maybe if, if you're breaking into it i also think that you know like we because we've been writing for so long and what we write that we are the comps for our own book here you know I like know. when they're like well well what would this be like it's like well okay let's like look at Fly Girl and Tuskegee yeah. and, and <laughs> yeah Codename Verity right. so like we could have blurbed this book ourselves in a way you know and I think <laughs> that's what we that made it <laughs> and we would have if we were both working <laughs> on it and well, so and that, that made it easy uh, that made it well, an easier sell but if you're breaking into writing i think that the takeaways are the advice i would give for somebody breaking into writing who wants to do a non-fiction like this um would be yeah definitely work with an agent like so you've got to convince an agent first and then they're going to help you get the best deal that you can get with a publisher um they'll get you to like the more traditional publishers um um photo uh, permissions okay. are a huge challenge. Get somebody else to do that. So find somebody who is who knows how to do that to help you do that and start okay. early. And um, annotations, like the last eighty pages of this book, are all annotations for our sources, and that is all courtesy of Elizabeth's beautiful mind. I'd say mm -hmm. take meticulous notes and keep track of that, and then yeah. give yourself the time to include it. Also, for nonfiction, quite often you are um, doing a book proposal rather than um, handing over an entire written book. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I'm trying to do a book proposal right now, and I'm, I'm struggling with it, like a nonfiction adult book pro proposal. I think it can be very challenging. So it's possible for Kid Lit, especially if you have a track record, that you could just do a sexy pitch like we did. Yeah. Um, I, I would add to that, that a couple of sticking points that I've found in pitching nonfiction are I've, I've had people that I find kind of fascinating personalities turned down because they're not kids. So, so, you know, 
we are both writing YA and that's what our publishers are looking right. for stuff that is going to be of interest to young adults and the other the other sticking point that we found in with this book as i recall was is it going to be exciting enough to be of interest to teens um and and we really did i, I don't remember if it if this might have been this might have been after oh my gosh we had this call where where um never mind it was um sheree had to leave in the middle of the sheree had to leave in the middle of the call and i kind of think that um it was when i was finishing that this question came up and it was is there enough exciting material in this book to make it uh, interesting to teen readers? And I was like, well, yeah, you know, Johnny's going to get chased by fighter pilots in Ethiopia and the wind's going to blow down their, their hangar. And I was like, yeah, of course it's going to be exciting. But I found myself having to play those things up. And, and I actually, don't feel that we should have to play those things up that people will find things interesting right. even if they don't find them exciting mm, yeah. but in making a pitch it's just something to bear right. in mind sexy it's the thing that um the thing yeah. I've, i learned about pitching um because uh, I used to work at Disney and, and a lot of my work was I was a development executive and we were pitching ideas all the time and you sell the sizzle not the steak <laughs> so what's going to make people walk into the room and go, oh, my gosh, that smells so good. I cannot wait to eat it. Because the minute you give them the steak, they nitpick. You know, they go, oh, this is overcooked. This is undercooked. But if they just smell that fat and the, the umami, you know, they're like, oh, and then imagining what it's going to be. So right. that, that would be my advice there is like. Yeah, if you get too into the weeds, and that's what's challenging about writing like a full nonfiction proposal, is you're in the weeds. You are giving them the steak, but you haven't gone to the grocery store yet. You are <laughs> trying to tell them exactly what it's going to taste like, but you don't even know if they have steak in the store. <laughs> Oh, Shree, that is so perfect. <laughs> I, I can't do it. I'm, it's, it's, like, it's driving me crazy. They, you're, you're like three sample chapters. I'm like, of what? I need to go do the research. Well, give a full outline. Tell them all the characters, who's going to be in this. And, and then all the comps. What book is this like? What book is it not like? If it's like that book, why would we still want it? I'm like, <laughs> I don't right. know. So oh, that can be hard. But if you can just, and, and so listen to the spark that got you excited. So, so you did this great book tour, um, where you went to schools and stuff for, I have two questions. One is for the authors. How do they, how do they figure out how to get out like into schools? Um, you know, uh, and, and how do you set something like that up? And then for schools or anyone who might be interested in hosting you, how do they set that up for themselves? How does that work? So I can talk a little bit about that. Um, so when I was, when I started out, uh, like my very first book, um, you know, just like my friends knew I'd written a book and somebody reached out to me and said, we're friends with a librarian and they do a book festival for teens every year. Do you want to, you know, would you, can I introduce you? And so, you know, talk to your librarians, talk to your people who know people um, to get into a bookstore, like to do a book launch, go around, especially to the independent bookstores and see if they would be willing to let you do something that way. That's how I started out. Um, and then my book rep, my local book rep. So my publisher has like a salesperson who works my region and she's a great resource because a lot of bookstores, particularly indie bookstores, have relationships with schools and they will bring writers into the school. So she could say, oh, I'm going to talk to these guys for for you. And um, we were lucky with with this book. We actually had uh, a publisher provided publicist. And so 
she and my book rep worked like I gave them a list of bookstores in the area that I had relationships with or that I thought would be good. And um, and then we all sort of reached out to them and said, this thing is coming and you drop off a copy of the book or whatever. And, and maybe they want to do something. Some of them I had a pre-existing relationship. And so did Elizabeth. So they were just like, absolutely. Elizabeth's coming to town. Oh, my God. You know? and, <laughs> and we we would do that. And um, and then I'm. Be a literary citizen. I have been a judge for an organization called the Lightbringer Foundation. Um, they do an Omega science fiction contest for young writers, and they had a new initiative for school visits. And so they happened to reach out to me um, to do something at the Octavia S. Butler Middle School. And that was coincided with, I was like, as a, as a matter of fact, I have a book coming out that month, you know, can we pull something together? So that's, that's how those came together. But I think it also helps to, uh, on your website, um, if you do school visits, have a school visit page there that explains that you do it and what you offer. So I used to just have like a PDF that they could download that said why it was good to bring writers to schools and um, the different ty types of talks I could give. You know, you can talk about the book, you can talk about being a writer, you can talk about something you're good at, like, oh, character development or whatever it is, and um, give them something and some, if you can get comments or blurbs from people, include that because most uh, teachers and librarians end up having to pitch you to the powers that be at their school, and that gives them something to go off of. There is a woman named Alexis O'Neill, who is a regional advisor for um, the Society of Children's Book Writers and Illustrators. Um, and she, her website, which I think is just her name, Alexis O'Neill, um, she gives a lot of information on how to prepare for a school visit, how to prepare a school for a school visit. So teachers, if you're having people come, um, things that are great is if you could team up with a local bookstore to either sell or to buy some of the books before the event so that the kids are primed for the event and they know that somebody is coming and they know a little bit about the book. That's super helpful. It's super helpful to um, give them some breathing room and a schedule. So there's time for a snack and bathroom breaks because teachers have like the stamina, the stamina of Hercules standing up in front of kids for eight hours solid and writers are weak boned people who sit in chairs and stare at screens all day. <laughs> so we just don't have the musculature or the stamina to do it in my, that's my experience. Like I can't speak to everyone, but that is how, and also like taking somebody, it's like sort of pulling a hermit crab out of the shell and saying dance, you know? And so, um, right. you know, we, we, it might take a little warming up, uh, to get, to get people going. And, um, those are things that can really help and promoting it to the kids in school um, to get them excited is really useful. Yeah. Elizabeth, yeah. do you have anything to add yeah. to that? I, I don't have anything okay. to add to that. Well, no, I did. My situation is very different from Cherie's because I don't have a local rep. I, I live in Scotland. I don't have, um, the, the the same kind of situation that m probably most of um, the people that we're talking right. to are in. Um, what I do have is the Scottish Book Trust, which and I realize this is this is very rarefied information here because Scotland is not a big place. Um, but the Scottish Book Trust is a um, charity that basically sponsors all things readable, <laughs> all things reading related in Scotland. Um, and they are, they have government funding as well. And one of the fantastic things that they do is a program called live literature funding, where they set a fee for an author. They allow schools to apply to have authors come to visit. And then they provide half the fee plus expenses for the author to visit that school. So it makes it it makes sure that authors get paid 
for their mm -hmm. events that they do, which is a very kind of like gray mm -hmm. area. It, it, I'll talk about people, that too. Particularly if you have a relationship with, with a school or with a library, you know, it's in your town or your kids go there or whatever. Very often you will want to help them out and do an author visit. And sometimes you'll do that for free. But when you do a free visit, it also sets a precedent. And so, the, you know, it's kind of like a give or take thing. And it is your time when you could be working. You know, if you're a teacher doing a visit, if you're a, a professional speaker, you will get paid for that. And, and authors probably should be compensated in some way too. So they make sure that the authors get paid they make sure that it's affordable for a school to have an author visiting them. And I really cannot sing their praises enough for what they've done, certainly for me and for other authors, because I know, I know people who run that circuit and, you know, are able to supplement their author income with school visits through programs like this. Um, and and the Scottish Book Trust also does amazing things like that. Well, they'll like sponsor they'll sponsor author residencies at a school where you go and you do ten school visits in a semester, or um, they have a, a tour that they that they take someone and they send them on a tour throughout. Um, they tend to focus on schools that are in more deprived areas and, and don't get authors coming to visit them because they can't afford them. So th they do a lot of good things. And that's, that's kind of where I'm doing most of my visits through is the Scottish Book yeah, Trust. I want to add to that, just what you said about like paying an author for a school visit. I do think it's important. Um, authors, especially kid lit authors are not necessarily making the big bucks. I would say 99.9% .9 of them are not making the big bucks and school visits is part of the income that sustains your ability to do the work. Um, but I totally get that like not every school feels like they have a budget. So there are organizations out there that offer grants um, that will help you finance a school visit. I know Poets and Writers Magazine offers something. Um, you might take a look, like I said, Alexis O'Neill's website. She, she directs you to places that might help. You can also try fundraising with your PTA um, uh, or your local government might offer something for artists to visit schools. So that can help. Um, it's really great to offer an honorarium. If you cannot do that for some reason, at the very least, it's really useful to buy the book. Buy the book. Sometimes you can get a discount from the publisher if the author is visiting. So that's something to ask the author about and also check the publisher's website. Um, if you really don't know where to start, most major publishers have a school and library visits department and they can help you find somebody in your budget. Um, and get you in touch with somebody. And there are also speakers bureaus that represent authors that might also be able to help. But um, yeah, the other thing is for writers out there, um, I hate to say this, but if a school knows you're coming for free, half the school doesn't know you're coming. There was no preparation for it because it has not, um, it hasn't risen to the level of costing them money. So it costs them time. And so you don't always get the, um, the quality of visit that you might want as the visitor if, um, if it's being done as a favor for somebody. Sometimes you do, but um, making it a business transaction tends to elevate it for both sides of the equation. Very interesting. I don't know. I'll, every time I did a school visit with a Coast Guard helicopter, I had everybody's attention. It turns out. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> That's the secret. That's the secret. You can be our yeah. Transport. Oh, I would love that. <laughs> oh, so I that would was, love that. That was a, such a drive great, by helicopter. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Please, just I'll <laughs> snort for you and land. I wish I could. <laughs> I wish I could still fly the things. That was really great. Um, in depth. Uh, uh, and I have more to say about that when we wrap things up. But as we are preparing to do that, where can we find you, Cherie? And should we be looking uh, for anything else from you in the near future? 
I, uh, you should, you can find me on my website, which is sherielsmith.com. You can find me on Instagram at rhymes with Capri because my first name Cherie rhymes with Capri. Um, you can also find me on Twitter under my name, but I'm trying, or X, I'm sorry, but I'm trying to move away from X. So look for me on Instagram <laughs> and coming up next, I have, let's see if I have a copy of it. I have another, um, this August, I have a, uh, graphic novel coming out, uh, which is another World War II story um, about a Japanese-American girl um, uh, stuck in Japan uh, when the war starts. And um, the, co- the cover is going to be different from this. It's going to be a full color cover, but the inside is more of a color wash. And uh, yeah, that comes out in August. That's amazing. How about you, Elizabeth? So you can find me at elizabethween.com and I am on Instagram as eween2412. So mm-hmm. E-W-E-I-N 2412-2412. And I'm on Facebook as well, uh, Elizabeth Ween. And I haven't got anything coming out. <laughs> and I'm not, I'm not being coy. I, I actually don't have anything coming well, out. Um, congratulations. This year. I'm, I'm working I feel on like it. you've been pumping Thank them you. out lately. So. <laughs> I know, right? Yeah. Uh, no, I'm working on a bunch of things, but they're not under contract. And uh, we'll see what happens. Well, good luck with all of them. And as always, thank, thank you. you both so much for the way that you bring your talent and your curiosity and your interest to this community and the things that you've done for to preserve our history. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much for listening. If you enjoyed this interview on YouTube or podcast, please like, subscribe, and drop a review if the option is available. Just like book reviews, podcast reviews help our stories reach a broader audience. I'd like to thank Michael Wilds of Massive and Crew for his help in producing this interview and his support of all things literary aviatrix. Blue skies and happy reading. Mm-hmm.